This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. If you are joining us on YouTube, you should know that this program is also available on your favorite podcast platform. This talk is with Peter Herman of San Diego State University. We will begin with his newly released book entitled Early Modern Others, Resisting Bias in Renaissance Literature. This talk will take us on a wide journey through early modern literary history, a history that includes but is not limited to Shakespeare. We will also take a look at Peter's work on the broad topic of literature and terrorism, the subject of his 2020 book entitled Unspeakable, Literature and Terrorism from the Gunpowder Plot to 9-11. This series is funded with support from the Aoyama Gakuin University Institute of the Humanities, and also with a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today and taking time to come visit uh, our little podcast and uh, YouTube series here, Speaking of Shakespeare. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is a great pleasure for me. I think you have just uh, published a book, the title of which is Early Modern Others. And this is a book that I have just finished and had to go back because there are a lot of details. You do some very, very um, deep, uh, you drill down a good bit into things that that are uh, uh, not immediately obvious to us. And you come up with this key term, pushing back. And you show us how when we want to see this whole period as, a, as an era of misogyny and racism, uh, imperialism, colonialism, all of those isms that are, are bad and Western and that in many cases have been attacked uh, in, in recent decades, uh, you're pushing back against that idea by showing that there is this sensibility that has grown out along with these horrible things, grew out and that were people were very well aware and they weren't unpowerful people, but they just weren't powerful enough and there's another way this book pushes back too, and that is in our time, uh, when when there are movements like recent movement in New Zealand to just oh. wipe Shakespeare out of the cu curriculum. We want to push back against that. You know, just because a play is about racism doesn't make it a racist play, and and make those distinctions clear. And when people go after erasing things, I think we just have to be very, very careful and indeed push back. So could you tell us more about this book and and uh, what you uh, hope to achieve? Uh, uh, well, ho what you hope your readers uh, will get from it? Well, I think that you've got it. Uh, I, you know, if, if I can sum up the thesis of this in just a few words, it's exactly as you said, someone always pushed back. There was always somebody, uh, very often very smart, you know, like Sir Thomas More. Some of them are very, very successful. Others are not as well known today. Uh, Thomas Deloney in particular. But there was always somebody who would look at what we would call, you know, the, the different isms, be it misogyny, which isn't an ism, it's an is, whatever, mm. <laughs> You know, hatred of women, hatred of class, people of a different ethnicity, people of different religions. And they would, as I say, push back against it, criticize it, um, demonstrate that the early modern period, like our own period, is not of one mind. I am as I say, surely not arguing that there is no racism in this period as we understand it. I am surely not arguing that this was a uh, feminist paradise or there was no anti-Semitism or anti-Islamic phobia, anti-Islamophobia at the time. Most certainly there were, but then is today, there was always somebody pushing back. And as I keep telling my classes, culture is complicated and contradictory. Now, like 
as you just said, there are many today, both inside academia and outside academia, who want to see the world in, no pun intended, I suppose, black and white terms. You're either a racist or you're an anti-racist. And there are a lot of critics who look at the early modern period in particular and speak in blanket terms. All white people thought the following. All men thought the following. All Christians thought the following. And that's just not true. Yeah. And in a sense, well, not in a sense, it's actually quite overt. What I am trying to do in this book, God knows if I'll succeed, but what I'm trying to do in this book is to push back against, for lack of a better term at the moment, the wokeness that I see all around me, where, again, everybody's supposed to think the same thing, and we're always supposed to assume that all white people are fundamentally racist. And the result of that is, I mean, give a couple examples in the book, that anybody who is white, you know, Shakespeare, Milton, all of them, they're all racist, they're all homophobic, they're all misogynist, and therefore, out they go. And I'm trying to push back against that. Ross Duthat of the New York Times, I think that's how his name is pronounced, mm -hmm. has a column today, I think, uh, suggesting that peak wokeness has finally decided to kind of reduce. So finally, you know, the wave is 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 receding. And it is a little bit, but it's only receding outside the academy. Inside the academy, it is as powerful today as it ever was. Yeah, yeah. And there... Uh... I, I picked up on this too, you know, with various podcasts that I listen to, whatever articles that I've read, read that uh, there there seems to be um, a drawing back in some quarters. Uh, things were pushed a little bit. The pendulum is coming back a bit, but exactly. the in, pendulum in, in, is starting to swing back. Yeah, and you know, we don't want it to swing back too far. Because you and I both remember in our early days of teaching and so forth, you know, when I walked into the early humanities classrooms with some brilliant, wonderful professors, but they, they were white men. There weren't many women. Uh, they're certainly uh, not were not represented. Uh, the humanities were not represented by people of color. Uh, and we in our careers have seen this great transition within the academy where you can take a, a you know a photograph of the faculty in humanities at uh, san diego state university and you'll see a picture that looks uh, a lot more like america than it did say in 1980 and so there we are and we are big advocates are of that both of us but then again uh you you just can't Take bring into this a sophomoric. Um, you you have to read it. You have to study it. You have to look at it and see what it is. You have to think, for instance, that there's an enormous number of oppressed people within England. And you point this out in your later chapters with Deloney and so forth. There's that fourth group that are fourth. yes, the fourth sort. Is that right? Yes, yeah, the, the people the of the fourth, fourth sort. sort almost you know there's just this classist attitude and there was antipathy between these two classes there was an unwillingness for the elite classes to understand how their bread was buttered and uh and th there's that now did these people suffer as badly as uh people in the caribbean uh when columbus arrived you know we could we could have that conversation no. they, they did not you know. no. uh, they, they weren't they weren't wiped out uh but they they suffered and they and it's, and it's the same kind of thing. Uh, what I really enjoyed is you leading into Thomas More with that introduction to remind us of the um, even even the uh, Spanish Christianity, the the canons uh, law set against destroying a people before at least trying to attempt to convert them. And yes, well, there are several points. One, in no way am I 
nostalgic for a humanities department and English department that was populated exclusively by white males. In one way, I suppose I was extremely fortunate because my education, both as an undergraduate and certainly in graduate school, was diverse. I had an, well, how not African American, an African Nova Scotian right. <laughs> combination, believe me. Um, you know, it was one of my main teachers, an undergraduate. Um, in graduate school, Columbia had very powerful women professors, especially my great uh, dissertation advisor, the wonderful Anne Lake Prescott. But there was also yeah. Carolyn Heilbrunn and Joan Ferrante, and I'm sure I'm missing one or two. So I never actually, and I recognize that this is very unusual, I never had an image of a humanities department, an English department that was populated exclusively by white men, white Christian men. Hmm. That has never been there. Now, going back to the book, um, we do need to remember that Bartolome de las Casas and Montesinos, they were lone voices. And they went up against the establishment church. They went up against the Spanish king. And as we all know, ultimately, they lost. However, However, the fact that they lost doesn't mean that their voices shouldn't be heard today. And in fact, you can draw a direct line between what De Las Casas says in his books, the later editions in English of Las Casas, and the abolitionist movement which starts up roughly late 1700s, early eight, you know, to, and then moves into the 18th century. But even that, there's always been a germ of it in English law. We need to remember that English law said quite overtly, there are no slaves in England. Now, outside of England, of course, they had no problems with it. But inside of England, there are no slaves, and if a slave ever landed in England, they were automatically freed. This is in Hall and Shedd's Chronicles, and it's actually repeated almost verbatim in Blackstone's commentaries in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. So here you've got the paradox. On the one hand, you have people talking about the liberty of the subject and the evils of slavery. And yet at the same time, they are holding slaves. That's, you know, a contradiction that needs to be made explicit. And it was a contradiction that was noted at the time. Samuel Johnson actually rather acerbically noted in an answer to something that Thomas Jefferson wrote, you know, how is it that those who you're yelping loudest, that's actually his word, yelping loudest against slavery, how come you own slaves? Yeah. So. Yeah, that's the old Jeff Jeffersonian problem, too. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. And recently I've been reading some of the pamphlets uh, that are part of the run-up to the American Revolution. And numerous times, many times, they are explicitly anti-slavery, explicitly saying that Black people deserve the exact same rights as anyone else because they are human beings like anyone else. Yeah. Now, for complicated and, frankly, ugly reasons, that point of view did not succeed yeah. until the 1800s. But, yeah. you know, as I said, the voice is always there. Yeah. Um, a short anecdote. I have a, um, 
a lifelong friend who's a business person. And he years, some years ago, he did a, um, he, he was a contractor. I won't go into great detail, but he was stiffed by one of his clients uh, for a lot of money. And basically what happened was that the clients had brought in a lawyer and said, listen, it's going to cost you more to sue me than to collect money from me. You know, and these were good people. I knew the people involved here. And I said, how, do, how can they possibly think that they can ask you to do this work and did you put all of this money into and not pay you for your work when they have no complaints about the results? And he said, when money's involved, people can rationalize anything. And I think I'd like to add to that when it's power, when it's imperial power, when it's gold, when you have these um, near, it seems all like Henry, Henry VIII, whether it's uh, the... Um, Oh, you know, the whoever's big in the Holy Roman Empire, or whatever, they're always out of money because they always have to have these troops out in the field uh, trying to get more land, trying to protect what they have. And they just had power and they wanted money. And you can form an ideology around that. Uh, and they they had they had the guns, they had the swords, they had the um they certainly did. Although, as I point out. At a certain point, the natives in Amerindia, <laughs> they started to fight back. Oh, yeah. And they did some pretty horrible things. Yeah. And say, I blame them. You know, yeah. they would capture a Spanish person and pour molten gold down his throat. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you want gold? Here, Here it is. have some. Yeah, here it is. Well, uh, moving more directly into your book, uh, you do talk about more his humanism as expressed in Utopia, uh, yep. a work that was a canonized part of the humanities curriculum in my college training. And it, as far as I'm concerned, should remain so. Uh, there's so much to be gathered from Utopia. And from Utopia after that, uh, if we could look into some of the Shakespearean stuff, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was actually very surprised when I first started working on this, how the connection between utopia and the new world was just not something that scholars had looked at. Mm -hmm. I remember I first started looking into it just because I was kind of interested in it. Oh, here's this fascinating book. Surely there is something, because this was like just at the time when Stephen Greenblatt was doing his new world stuff, mm -hmm. uh, that great book of his yeah. uh, new world encounters and the like. Surely something has been done on Moore's Utopia and the New World, because Moore says three or four times, I think, that Hitlodeus sailed with Amerigo Vespucci several times. Where is it? Oh, it's in the New World. Okay, surely there must be something. But for whatever reason, no. You know, and and the one or two articles that I found on it. Uh, except basically it's not a big deal, which seemed to me about as wrong as you were going to get. So that was the germ for the Utopia chapter. And then, you know, you compare Moore's vision of utopian civilization, which is always, you know, meant to be better than, well, partially better than European. He always complicates that relationship. And then you compare that to what's going on um, in the new world, you know. So, but my point is that the more in utopia challenges the notion that any and all civilizations in the new world are, by definition, inferior. Mm -hmm. And then you add to that uh, the section on who is going to you, who is who is going to go to utopia to convert the natives, and it's basically the worst that Europe has to offer. Moore is very clear that theologians are going to go there. Well, that's not a neutral term for Moore. It's because he hates theologians. So these are the people, and sure enough, when they come, or one in particular, there's a utopian who is on fire with Christianity and immediately starts to say, if you don't believe in Christianity, then you're damned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're not allowed to do that and that cuts against um the basic rules of utopia now while it's true utopus the king exiles the band as i say the damage has been done because once that virus enters a culture 
It's like COVID. It seems to be almost impossible to get rid of. And then there's one other part I want to talk about, just because I, I just found it so fascinating that in 15, 20 or so, more would intuit this, which is the danger of importing Western technology to a culture that isn't prepared for it. Yeah. And this is taken there's a direct allusion here to one of Vespucci's letters. So, I mean, he's clearly thinking in these terms. And he gives the, talks about how he gives the native, these natives, the, um, I was about to say the periscope. That's not it at all. The compass. That's right. It's small. <laughs> you know, we're used to it. They're not. Yeah. And we know the dangers. So we're not going to go out too far. These people don't. And they think, oh, great, a compass. I can go anywhere I want to with this thing. And Moore says, this can very well lead to disaster. And I'm thinking, how is he able to intuit this? That exporting technology to a culture that doesn't have this technology is not going to work out well, or it may very well not work out well. Yeah. And I suppose you could also push it even further by saying that Moore is basically warning the West, all of us, about where technology can go. Yeah, We have, as he would say, the prudence to know how to use this technology. And here, of course, I'm thinking about AI. <laughs> well, th there you are. Yeah, that's on, on the horizon. And I'm even thinking uh, when social media platforms were dumped on us, suddenly we had these handheld objects everybody could get on. And uh, we're in a culture that has a free press. Uh, I think people who lived in cultures that have state-owned media may have been better trained to to manage this explosion in media right. because they they knew already they were already trained culturally to be skeptical of what the state owned media said whereas we have a little bit more trust in what we read and and whatnot and then boom uh, and it's shaking things up but I do see that you know you when you just drop this into a middle of a population and you know more still in the kind of seminal period of the printing press which just changed everything uh and uh, yes. better, better technology to make the paper to get more out and of course he's using it but i i think that might be where he's drawing his ideas it is from. the irony however or the tragedy if you will moore is writing this in what 1515 15 16 or so and Henry VIII had just asked him to be part of his court. The Reformation had not yet fully taken hold in England. Well, Henry VIII, is, excuse me, Moore is going to join Henry VIII's court. He's going to be the Lord Chancellor. And essentially, he becomes the hitman against the attack dog against Lutheranism mm -hmm. and all of that wonderful stuff in Utopia about how maybe God wants us to have multiple forms of worship right out the window. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, this week I could talk about this for hours yeah. uh, because, but I wanted to move into uh, misogyny, the shrew. Uh, you take up in your second chapter the shrew the, the, the shrew plays of course the there's more than, more than one and uh, uh, we of course are familiar, familiar with the Shakespearean play but it, it sort of surprised me you came out very directly and said listen these are not in the essence misogynistic plays if you looked at them uh, I spoke with uh, Richard Stryer uh, at the uh, University of Chicago and he I think you would find the kinship great there. Richard the, 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 the great Richard Stryer uh, you you sit back and you look at this and you go, wait a second, when we take in the whole, you know, the, the entire form here, uh, we are possibly seeing ideas of empowerment, feminine empowerment here. And so I'll, I'll hand that to you. 
you know, Richard and I disagree on this. And <laughs> he he uh, he read part of the book and actually no, he read the whole book and we were constantly going back and forth about this. I, I strongly suspect it would be a much better book if I had the benefit of our discussions before I submitted it. But my view, at least, though, is that if you go from the taming of, I'm just sort of glancing over here because they never get it right, the taming of a shrew to the taming of the shrew to the tamer tamed, you see an in, increasing pressure on misogyny. Now, the my well, there's also another point. For reasons that I just frankly don't find convincing in the least, many Shakespeare critics think that the taming of the shrew came before the taming of mm -hmm. a shrew. This to me makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, so I am assuming that a shrew is roughly 59, you know, late 1580s or so. Mm -hmm. We know that it was performed uh, because there's a reference to it in Hall, in not Holland Shed, in uh, Henslow's diary. Mm -hmm. And then because it's a popular play, Shakespeare does his own version of it, which we now call the Taming of the Shrew. Mm -hmm. Taming of the Shrew is a really weird play in a lot of ways, not the least of which is we don't have the ending. Fly does not come back. I mean, is, was it lost? Was it used to wrap fish? Was this intentional? I mean, at this point, it's impossible to know. The play was also not printed in quarto, which is not that unusual, but it's a little bit odd nonetheless, because other plays were published in quarto. And there's no record of a performance of it. Francis Miras, when he gives his list of Shakespeare's favorite, you know, his favorite Shakespeare plays, leaves Shrew out. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to know what the contemporary response was. Nonetheless, John Fletcher, circa 1610 or so, writes his sequel to The Taming of the Shrew, which means the play had to have been current in some way. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, why would you write a sequel to it? Um, and here you can see, uh, you know, the movement away from a play where it's both misogynistic and anti-misogynistic to just mis anti-misogynistic. I mean, the end of the play, there's an overt call for parity in marriage, that men and women need to be treated equally. The Taming of the Shrew, on the other hand, is really mixed. And as one of my teachers, Gene Howard, put it in an article a long, long time ago, um, if you want to say that, that Catherine is broken, you can do that, but you have to ignore certain scenes. Mm -hmm. If you want to say that she is playing at the end, same thing. Mm -hmm. You can do it, but you have to ignore certain things. Mm -hmm. That problematic speech at the end where she, uh, if you take it at its literal value, she is fully submitting. She has uh, given given up the fight. But on an, another glance, it could be ironic, you know, depending on how you want to receive. It could be ironic, but yeah, Bianca and the Widow clearly don't think it's clearly don't think she's yeah. being ironic they are both appalled at what they are seeing now what also complicates things is the final speech shakespeare adapts from the taming of a shrew and makes it all about politics and he puts into it well you know, a view of politics which is absolutist that the subject has no right of rebellion to 
uh, to the Lord who, so long as the commands are lawful, so long as the commands are in line with God's laws. Now, the problem with that, of course, is at the end of the speech, we get an example of a command. She says, I'm ready to put my foot, my hand underneath my Lord's boot, which no one is going to, in this period, is going to assume is rational, mm -hmm. is appropriate. Not even Petruccio does that. Yeah. But if that's her view of what a Lord is entitled to, the kind of obedience the Lord is entitled to, we are ha we are going to have real problems. Yeah. And, well, one other point is that while I think that that would have not gone over too well in circa 1590 or so, that kind of rhetoric in 1623 is really not going to go over yeah. well. So I think, as I said, at the end, Shakespeare tilts the balance towards Katharina being broken, but we are meant to be appalled at this what a foolish duty you call this says either the widow or bianca <laughs> one yeah. or the other yeah isn't that a shakespearean thing uh, if we just take it away from uh true for a moment and racism for a moment if uh, in 12th night I, I don't see a way uh I, I i don't see a way to understand the play in a way in which malvolio isn't over punished Okay, we don't like him. He's officious. He deserves punishment. But they really, really punish. And you go, oh, you know, I'm being, you know, my chain is being jerked here. I am being drawn in with these people who are essentially torturing this poor man eventually, right? Yeah. Whatever he did, he didn't deserve all of that, you know, uh, and he was confined. And I remember maybe 10 years ago, I went to a production a little bit longer ago than that of um the at Globe Theater production, uh, Merchant, uh, the Merchant of Venice, and they pretty much, you know, what is playing Shakespeare straight, but there there wasn't any emphasis on how badly Shylock was treated by the, let's say, white people, or and oh, um, well, by the Christians, by the Christians, by the the yuppies, <laughs> you know, those, you know, the beautiful, the Beaumont, the beautiful people, but they just played it out straight with Shylock. And you get this, this sense, this man is being abused. You can see why he would become the man he became, why whatever cruelty that's in him might not be the product of his own nature, but might be something that was developed and cultivated systemically uh, by this uh, culture of beautiful people around him who spurn him. And it just seems there, it's also there in Othello, where, you know, uh, I spoke with David Brown, a young um, a scholar who does Black studies uh, at Trinity College. And, you know, looking at it from a Black perspective, right, you can see Iago as someone, where does his evil come from, right? And it comes from the fact that he has to hate Othello. And this hatred is it may be an outgrowth of self-loathing and both feed on each other. And that creates the evil in him. And this thing, and it goes right into Othello. You know, it, it takes it takes over. Uh, so it's so complex. But to, to just, you know, say Othello is a racist play is, I'm sorry, just idiotic. I, don't, I cannot imagine anybody who's read that play or seen the production uh, who would call the play itself racist. Well, I can give you a couple of <laughs> names of people who say exactly that. Yeah. Um, just a general comment. Shakespeare loves to insert lines which, which raise questions and you have no answers to this. For example, in The Shrew, Kate talks about how she needs to speak or else to, she needs to express the anger of her heart or else her heart will break. What? <laughs> What's, what are you talking about? And you don't, you don't know. 
Um, similarly in the play, we hear that uh, that Bianca and the widow are conferring by the parlor fire. What are they conferring in that about? Well, you know, given everything in the play, I doubt if they're talking about how to make the best kind of blueberry scone. But we don't know. It's left up in the air. He does something also very similar to this at the end or almost towards the end of Midsummer Night's Dream where Hermia and Helena's last line, Hermia's last line also is like, one of the two males, I think it's Lysander says, oh, wasn't that the Duke? And her last line is, yea, and my father. Where's that going to go? What's their relationship going to be? You don't know. Because they're completely silent for the rest of the fifth act. So there's no reconciliation that we see. So, I mean, Shakespeare loves to, to, to borrow from what I say about Milton and I suppose also terrorism. You know, he loves to generate incertitude. What does this mean? You know, where's this going to go? And he raises the questions and refuses the answers. Yeah. Same thing for Iago. What is it that is motivating him? I mean, Iago gives three or four different answers. Yeah. None of which seem to be satisfactory. Yeah. So, you know, is he, he says he thinks that Othello was sleeping with his wife. It's like, really? Where is that coming from? You know, is it because someone got promoted over him? Well, I suppose, although, again, he doesn't really get come back to that. Who was it um, who said that Iago was a motiveless malignancy? <laughs> It's very, very true. Uh, I think it was Coleridge or Cates. Yeah. One or the other. Yeah. I, I, I kind of, uh, I tend to think of Iago as, as being part of a um, systemic ideology uh, that in the end, uh, in the end, if you think you're better, if you think you uh, have been shunned, uh, if you're in an ideology of where just because you're, you're you're white, you're better than someone who is not, uh, it, in order it takes an enormous amount of psychic power to maintain that, and it's destructive, to the, uh, it's destructive to the soul. Uh, and you know, I, in the examples in the American South, uh, right. as, as much of the burden that is placed upon black people in the uh, Jim Crow era. Uh, that that is uh, that comes at the cost of what we would call the oppress oppressive class, the uh, dominant class. It comes at a great cost to them too, and a kind of evil is created. Uh, and yet, and yet, the Venetian Doge Duke, whatever they are, they don't share Iago's view. I mean, the, all of the nasty comments about Othello and race the thick yeah. lips, uh, the, you know, they're making the beast with two backs, the Barbary Ram, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're all said by the bad guys of the play, yeah. Iago, Roderigo, and Brabantio. When Brabantio comes roaring in and says, oh my God, my daughter is married, to, you know, this, this terrible animal, this thing, the response is not, oh, my God, a black man has married a white woman. Ah! The response was, what are you talking about? Yeah. yeah. Then when he he unloads, then this is it. You need something called proof. Yeah. You don't have it. So, you know, I, I resist the notion that the Venetians are ipso facto racist. Now, having said that, Othello has clearly absorbed a negative view of blackness. You know, when he says, for happily I am black, yeah. he's the one who's raising this. No one else has. 
except for, of course, Brabantia. But that's what, again, sort of what makes the play so fascinating, so complex. Venetian culture is not universally, systemically racist because the Doge and company don't have a problem with Othello marrying Desdemona. Yeah. They're very, very clear about that. Yeah. Well, that kind of brings me to your third chapter. And it's a, a little bit of a bone I would like to pick with the world. <laughs> because, or, uh, I mean, which is the third chapter? Yeah, the the uh, uh, where That's when you get into class. And, uh, the oh, little, my the Deloney, Deloney chapter. chapter. I, oh, I am I so, I'm so ill with this uh, since my younger days, just the uh, in the American consciousness, the, when we when we do identity politics and this sort of thing, the erasure of class and uh, of of e economy, you know, and I, I'm an old Foucaultian, you know, I'm just going, you got to look into this, right? There's a huge difference between the rich and the poor. And you can, you know, we, we're talking in the shrew about it and also in midsummer about it, pretty much elite women, right? From an elite class. When you get into Shoemaker's Holiday, you get to see this whole other world. I love this element mainly because it's so rare. There's not that much of it in Renaissance uh, drama uh, in particular, but in there's not the, the working class, the largest body of people in society don't have a voice and this is women men whatever color whatever background they're from uh and we do get it in deloney and you know of course when decker adapts him yeah i, I love those plays i yeah. love deloney i i i was introduced to deloney my first or second year of graduate school by the late lamentably late uh howard schless and I always wanted to do something with him. And then the editor for Broadview asked me if I wanted to do an edition. I said, how about a collected Deloney? He said, how about one? <laughs> how about we just do what, not a collect? No. Okay, fine. <laughs> so I did the so I did my little edition of um Jack of Newbury, yeah. where I asked him how many copies it sold i think he said 75 i never asked <laughs> him again i don't want to know but the stuff is phenomenal and what's phenomenal is that a it was done it was written suggesting that these you know these the notion that the fourth sort can push back was absolutely thinkable and it's phenomenal because the book was literally read out of existence mm -hmm. three editions i think the the, the the edition that we finally have is the fourth the fourth printing i should say all the others were just literally read out of read out yeah they don't exist anymore so yeah. my point is that the stuff was incredibly popular yeah so he's clearly saying something that's resonating all over the culture and the same thing would also go for decker's shoemaker's holiday which was also a very very popular play yeah so you know again you have holland no not holland shed this is in front of holland shed it's you know william harrison and then it gets turned into sir thomas smith's you know the fourfold division of the culture and the fourth is the fourth sword those who are to be ruled and to rule no other right oh well, you know they too have a voice and it's yeah. through deloney and it's through decker and other writers yeah for people in our audience who may not know this deloney himself was a silk weaver i believe was his uh yes. craft and uh they I need to check into this. Uh, uh, many of these people in his society belong to guilds that were quite. They all, yeah. They all, yes. And I mean, you know, uh, unlike to today, I mean, you couldn't just simply hang out a shingle and say, guess what? I'm a barber <laughs> or a rope maker. No, you had yeah. to belong to, uh, for lack of a better phrase at the moment, a professional organization. 
Yeah. And some of them were quite powerful and some of them, yeah, maybe not so much. Yeah. Powerful. But it, um, it, it all feels, it, it feeds into this. I mean, well, let's face it. The playhouses were not filled with uh, the elite. I mean, they're, they, they, you know, so. Not entirely true. When I was doing the research for another article on um, Shakespeare's history plays, and I was doing some research on the impressing, yeah. meaning, you know, the rating of lower class people and putting them into the army. I came across a um, set of documents. It was, you know, in an article on this. It wasn't like I was one doing this where London's mayor did something that he was told not to do, and he didn't care. He raided a playhouse. Uh -huh. That meant he got everybody. Yeah. And it's absolutely fascinating because, yes, you had some of the lower, the lowest of the low, but as the mayor was complaining about this, you also caught some of the Queen's men. Yes. You caught some of the yeah. lawyers. They even oh. caught an earl. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't mean to suggest that the elite didn't go to plays, but well, they you know, most they, certainly did. Yeah. You know, and the topmost of society, the plays went to them. Yeah. Uh, so well, the yeah, the court, they, they, I think they were designed, you know, the midsummer is very, it's amazingly flexible how it could entertain and not offend a court audience. And yet you can take it right into the globe uh, or the, um, uh, whatever the northern the theaters n north of town the the big yeah. public ones uh, and it works there too it has that amazing flexibility and it's the summer, jokes, the it's jokes on the summer. tradesmen you know the mechanicals I don't that it works it works for the aristocracy and it also works and kind of uh, uh, I the Brits would say taking the piss out of uh you know your own your own folks right you know these guys these tradesmen and uh if you are one of them right and some of their uh and some of their pretensions which are always punished in all pretensions among that class are punished in shakespeare that is true yeah midsummer is an astonishing play i don't know how she does it because on the one hand as, as the phrase goes, if you're not on the floor laughing, there is a hole in your soul. Yeah. <laughs> and yet there are these moments of dissonance, you know, the the undercurrent of violence that just keeps coming back over and over and over again. It's like there's yeah. this dissonant bass note, and he's able to combine the two, and it's just astonishing. Yes, it, it really is astonishing uh, because, it, you know, the, and in the end, uh, the uh, the young people that, the, you know, the our, our four lovers who are married, their comments about the production. Right. If you're oh, part of, if you're part of their class, ha ha, look at these stupid people. Right. If you're not, you go, what asses these people are. You know, these guys, yeah, they're making fools out of themselves. But, you know, come on. Uh, I mean, then there's you know, all it says great line, beshrew my heart, but I do pity the man. She's yeah. the only one of the aristocracy to actually get the message of the play. Yeah. Um, have you seen this, what Sam Rockwell does to that final scene? It's extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, it's in the last movie version of Midsummer yeah. Night's Dream, where he starts off, he's playing, you know, Th is it Pyramus or Thisbe? I always forget which is which. Yeah. <laughs> um, and at first, you know, he's saying the lines comically, oh, it's a movie, movies. Oh, you know, and it's all ridiculous. And it's all very funny. And then he stops and he starts to speak the speech straight seriously his eyes were green as leeks and all of a sudden you are weeping at the tragedy i remember reading one yeah I, i'm sorry i didn't know that i just had forgotten the name of the actor uh that's the yeah that's, that's i just the, showed it in class which I, is yeah well it's, it's coming up in my class next week that same um 
Uh, I, that same, I, I love that. I, I still have um, uh, Kevin Klein in my mind. The bottom, oh, you know, Klein he's, he's so good. He's so good at that funny, role. You know, uh, but yeah, the, the switch, uh, the switch that um, Disby makes, uh, it's just a, it's an amazing moment of acting to show you how quickly you can turn uh, a sentiment. He takes the wig off, and, and that makes that makes him more feminine at that time. Uh, it seems if if we can say that now, but uh, uh, you 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 feel a sense of pathos at that moment. Exactly. It's, that's just. I, I remember fabulous. reading yeah. once that uh, Rockwell hadn't planned it, so the other actors who are watching this are not expecting this. So when um, you see them lean forward with this, what is happening here? They are actually responding in the moment to what he is doing. Yeah, I mean, I hope that's true. <laughs> yeah, well, we're, we're talking about the Michael Hoffman production uh, yeah. of, of yeah. the, who does such a wonderful job. Sets it in the nineteenth century, uh, shows the yeah for you know the flexibility again of that play, how you can drop it here and there, um, and. And that sort of thing. Well, let's move on. Uh, I, I I love the class element here. Oh, I wanted to ask you one thing though. I've seen this. I don't think I came up with the idea. Although I had, you know, how you have an idea and go, "Wow, I have an idea," and then you start reading and you realize somebody thirty years ago had the same idea. Oh well, yeah, yeah, uh, happens all the time. But I thought at one point I was working on those mechanicals. I have an article coming out about that and uh, the silk weaving. Deloney, it's hard to, you know, there may be some a direct reference to Deloney because he was well known as a writer of ballads. Yes. And there, there may be a model there for the character of Bottom, uh, again, taking taking the piss out of uh, a guy you might know. Uh, like he takes, like he does with the Master of Rebels in at least the, the quarto version, right? Everybody knows that uh, Philostrate or Philostrate is Edmund Tilney. There's no no other person he could be. Very brave of Shakespeare, given T Tilney's power, but it also shows that um, I don't know the fellowship when you feel close enough to a person to, you know. My to guess is. We don't know what it is, uh, but my guess is that Tilney knew what was coming, saw it, and when he saw it, he just grinned from ear to ear. Everybody knows oh, no, no mistake like that could ever oh, happen. No. You know, th there would <laughs> never accidentally be a play for the Queen's Court or for a court. Exactly. No, right? I, I, is the impossibility. No, no, no. There's no reason not to assume that that they didn't have a sense of humor about themselves. Yeah, of course. Of no course, reason. that would have been Tilney's worst night, nightmare, that if somehow a play makes it through and uh, and these guys are suddenly playing in front of his, uh, you know. Audience making fun of his no, queen, I, I yeah. think he knew it. And... Yeah. Uh, but maybe there's a little uh, Deloney in bottom, too. I, I don't know. Possibly. Uh, Although Deloney, I mean, the story there is a really fascinating one where, as you say, Deloney is a silk weaver and he has this sideline in writing ballads, which are sort of the lowest, you know, in the hierarchy, the lowest of the lowest of the low. Um, but then you've got the crisis of the 1590s and you have the starvation, the dearth, the food riots, the sense that uh, the safety net has completely broken, the rich are getting richer, the poor are left to starve. And Deloney then writes a ballad with the queen, featuring the queen and the people, quote, on the want of court, unquote. Mm -hmm. And that gets him into real trouble. The uh, powers that be, London's mayor, go looking for him. He's about to be arrested. Near as we can tell, because the Lord Mayor in his letter to Burley then says, we can't find him. Mm -hmm. Went underground, which I would imagine isn't all that hard to do in London at a time without addresses, without telephone numbers and the web, credit cards. 
et cetera. Um, but it's at that point that he starts writing these prose fictions. And that's where, you know, the, how he then moves from um, a situation where authority is directly threatening him. I mean, presumably he was not, the people were not all that polite to the queen and that didn't go over well. Mm -hmm. But the kind of expansive, generous vision that you get in the, you know, in the prose fictions. Granted, what he is doing there is completely overturning the conventional ladder, putting those who work first and aristocrats right at the bottom. Mm -hmm. But he does it uh, generously. He's not saying these people all need to die, just they need to. Just the workers need to have their value recognized. Their interests have to be put first, which in his fiction, that is exactly what Henry VIII realizes. Uh -huh. er earlier on, yeah. Well, there is Deloney's, you know, the, he moves from his uh, trade, silk weaving, to, to an aspiring writer. And there is that uh, reflection in Bottom, too. I just, uh, you know, he, he's trying oh, yeah. to be something else. Uh, but to, to go back to the um, the, the idea of um, the rioting, uh, it, it was a very riotous time. And again, that's how Shakespeare doesn't get us. He's not a city dramatist. He doesn't put us there. You know, if there's a, if, if there's a riotous in Coriolanus and of course it's, it's in another time and place, but it's Absolutely. right. You know, it's right there in, in, uh, in memory in living memory. And then Coriolanus's attitude toward the people and, uh, uh that just, just disdain, uh, for their sense of, uh, what entitlement that they deserve food. Um, and then it, it oh, comes up. Yeah. And it comes up again in Julius Caesar. There's, there's a lot of street action there, um, riotous behavior. And, and, you know, there's a river, <laughs> you know, in Julius Caesar, there's a river. It's not the Thames. There are people riding their uh, citizens uh, being um, outspoken and, uh, uh, um, you know, not not being uh not addressing their superiors in the right way that kind of thing but it always happens in rome and it happens somewhere else but you can see this reflected uh what we call working class uh contempt for and there's one case in your book where the uh what the mayor of london had a, has a chance to move his daughter up into the aristocracy and he doesn't want to do it he doesn't like those people they spend too much money they're in the okay, excuse me that's a, that's, that's a lucy and a oakley is that right? that's the shoemaker's holiday the yes. shoemaker's holiday yes yes it's, uh, it's you know the lord <laughs> you know the earl is the one who's subject to class prejudice which is really kind of a wonderful thing and it's, it's because, a reversal you know, right yeah. that's because yeah what's this it um courtiers what's the line courtiers spend more in a day than i am worth all year yes, like, right. you, know, they, you know the aristocracy are a bunch of wasteful you know drone you know parasites really yeah yeah well let's move on to religious tolerance i want to get through oh yeah uh the um uh, and I'm, I'm just interested i was surprised by this because uh i've looked a lot uh, you know i've i've been a um a marlow guy for decades and tamberlane I, I would say that that one play may have been the reason i i thought i could maybe do this this business Right. I just never, you know, I've never seen it in such a character, but the, those lines, just the, the art artistry of it, like you can't miss it. You know, you can be a, a dummy like me from a, a, you know, farm town and you just can't miss it. And then it's, it's Tamberlane you know? and you go, God, I love this stuff. You know, uh, this guy is a really, really bad dude and I can't help but like him. Because he's such a good poet, you know, and then uh, you know, Selenus and King Lear, the um, uh, this, but uh, Tamburlaine does not care for those people in Damascus. 
<laughs> when he's approached by the virgins, he goes, no, I set out my rules. Show him the sword, right? Hoist them on the gates. And then right at that moment, he turns around and just delivers oh, yes. a sonnet to Xenocrity. This is yeah. beautiful. And how much he loves. And he goes, oh, I'm getting to be girlish in my, you know, I, I, it's just outrageous. But the contempt that Tamburlaine can show on an early modern stage toward Christianity, just amazing. Yes, it's astonishing. I don't know how he got, or maybe he didn't get away with it. I don't know. <laughs> It is astonishing. And, you know, it demonstrates, the play demonstrates once more that culture is complicated. It is contradictory. And yes, obviously, you, you know, church and state at this, you know, in this culture were one. And as I also tell my students, it, this was a culture where people did not believe in God. They knew. God existed. They didn't believe in heaven and hell. They knew that heaven and hell existed. And yet, even then, there's this pushback, you know, this, you know, what you think at four in the morning when you're alone and no one else is, you know, no one else can hear you. And this is kind of your worst nightmare come true. And I think that with, with Tamburlaine, the criticism of Christianity is inseparable from the class criticism. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that he takes all those early modern certainties, he being Marlowe at this point, and breaks them. Yeah. I mean, Marlowe is this, you know, ultra skeptical voice who takes what society holds to be sacred and unquestionable and questions it. So it really is just astonishing. I mean, that's at least what he does in Tamburlaine and in The Jew of Malta. Yeah. Dr. Faustus, maybe, maybe not. Well, he gives it to you straight, Dr. Faustus. You want heaven and hell? I'll give you heaven and hell. All right. Yeah, exactly. I'll give you, you, I'll give you devils. And <laughs> let's let's face it, devils are a lot more interesting than angels. So we're just here it is and here's it's, a, it, it's almost comic that ending you know being dragged down you know and uh you know looking up at the firmament you know and uh, i can see christ's blood streaming in the firmament it, it almost goes over and in, in fact it kind of does uh, in my mind yeah there's this wonderful line where uh he's just called up mephistopheles and he says to mephistopheles well i think hell's the fable and Mephistopheles says, I think so still, till experience to change your mind. It's like, what are you talking about? No. But um, and getting what, back to in hell, nor, nor are we out of it. You know, that, that yes. line. Yeah. Uh, God, lay there's some great, just so many. Well, I, I, I think it goes back to the point that even somehow born out of born out of these movements uh, to consolidate a new church in the Church of England, uh, to maintain in from the Church of Rome and whatever uh, countries in Europe, uh, these movements that are were highly oppressive towards people, even indigenously, but of, of course, you know, led to massive genocide uh, because mm -hmm. that that one idea, we are Christian and you are not, makes us better. You know, this is before we get to white. Um, and then well, we're white too, and we have guns. But uh, the the thing is that born out of this is also the pushback that you point to. And I thought, and, and, and you know, at first I thought it was idiosyncratic kind of a selection of text. But I see now, you know, having read the book, how this works together. You could have done this book with other text. Uh, but, I could have, but I wanted to finish. You got to you got to select something, you know. Uh, and it doesn't seem to me like you blindfolded with yourself and uh, threw darts at you know a whiteboard or you know at the wall or anything not. because these these are very seminal works Utopia Lear uh, Tamburlaine in my view uh, and of course you know Merchant of Venice these these things do they're, they're salient you know if you're going to pick something that shows uh, that gives examples of what you're talking about these are the right choices Titus Othello. And London's Africans, you know, as yes. we get to the end of the book, 
yeah, that's that's where you have to go. Uh, to, well, uh, and that's also why it's at the end, assuming yeah. I actually have a reader who's going to go all the way through. But for that, uh, for the that chapter, I have to give credit where credit is due. Uh, while um, I have some criticisms, what Imtiaz Habib did, going into these archives and finding all of these records of Afro-Britons mm -hmm. is an extraordinary service. And now, also, these records have been digitized. Yes. They're available yes. through, the, I think it's called the Switching the Lens yes. uh, website through uh, London City Archives. So, you know, I don't even think I thought about the audience when I first started being a professor. Um, I don't think I ever really thought about whether there was darker people who were living in London, but there were. And uh, in between Intiaz Habib and uh, Kaufman, also has a terrific book about, you know, Black people in Tudor London. Uh, we realize, I mean, there was a relatively small, but they're still there, community. And using the records that uh, the late Intiaz Habib uh, came up with, we see that they married black and white married there was not any uh objection or bar to this they had children the children were baptized and they carried on there's one in particular her name is mary phyllis and nobody knows why the uh the parish clerk gave such an extended uh, account of this, but it's it's a her, basically her life, this woman's life history, her employment history, leading up to the fact that she decided that she needed to be baptized, that she wanted to be baptized. And what's you know extraordinary about this is, well, clearly her not being baptized was no bar to her being employed and varied by various people. Mm -hmm. So she gets baptized, but the baptism isn't just by herself she goes with a group there's clearly a community here i mean it was their version it seems of a bat mitzvah you know they then go have cake and ale afterwards but again my point is that here is a woman who is clear a, a black woman african woman who is part of a community mm -hmm. you cannot assume that everybody in early modern England did not like black people. Right. You cannot assume that. And I think that once you, you realize that there is no reason to assume that there are no black people in Shakespeare's audience, mm -hmm. that no black people were going to the theater, just as, you know, there's, well, I think we actually have some evidence to prove that there were women who went to the theater as well but once you realize that then you know titus and uh, othello i think they look very different mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah uh that you're not just dropping in this exotic notion of uh the Afri african that there would be a, a yeah, record right over here you yeah, know yeah. I, I just bought some, you know a basket from this man yeah or you know i just had a beer with him yeah, yeah. Um, you you could see though that maybe uh, their blackness got them othered in these communities too, and there would Sometimes. be an understanding of that also. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm going but, just to encourage people to read all the way through to get to chapter six, <laughs> Titus and Othello. Uh, there's so much stuff, Peter. You've done. You're you, I think, have benefited greatly from uh, the proximity you have to the Huntington. Uh, no, not, no? At not at all. Oh, not at all. Not oh. At all. It's uh, mostly Early English or... books online. Ebo. Ebo. 
early English books online. I uh, we struggled about ten years ago. We struggled. We it climbed. You know, we we were w ready to die on that hill to get access, and we won. We got the attention of the right people here in Japan, and it, it just changes everything. It changes everything. I will yeah. never forget. Um, I was doing a chapter, researching a chapter for the Milton book, um, destabilizing. And I wanted to find out what was the view of the book of Job in this period. And I yeah. found that there was like this 10, 12 volume uh, commentary on the book of Job over published over the course of a decade. Really. Yeah. Well, long story short, no live, no one library in the United States had this book had this, you know, so right. there's like some are at the Huntington, some are at the Newbury, some are at the Folger, you yeah. know, one has four, six, and eight, the other has one, three, and five. So if I was going to consult this, either I was going to use microfilm, God help us all, or I would have to travel the world for this. Yeah. Well, it took me an hour and a half yeah. to yeah. do the, you know, to get to see, to get yeah. what I needed. I mean, I was able to consult each and every one of these books. And yeah. yes, I mean, I, I've always been, because of my training, uh, more interested in primary sources than, uh, than theory. Yeah. You know, good yeah. primary source quickens my soul. Yeah. Yeah. And, Early English books online, Ebo, changed my life. It's yeah. just extraordinary. Yeah. And now there's actually another added little twist to it where there's something called TCP. Text Par Partnership. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Where many of the books, not all of them, but many of them have been transcribed and made searchable. Right. What that allowed me to do was look at the use of the word black. Mm -hmm. Was black, you know, always used negatively. Yeah. So I, you know, put in a chronological, you know, uh, chronological limit of one year. Yep. I think I chose 1595. Yeah. And it did black. Yeah. Got a bunch of, but, you know, I'd say 75% of the sites were negative. 25 were very positive. Yeah. Edward the Black Prince. Yeah. That's not done negatively. Tough guy. Tough guy. Tough guy. You, so, you, you know, the, the availability of these texts through early English books online democratizes research because if you have access you know you could be anywhere so yeah. long as you have access to Ebo and you can get access to Ebo now through the renaissance society of america yes america. yes i'm not sure if you can get the searchable uh i haven't gone back we have it now uh, okay we bought a um kind of national license in japan uh mm -hmm. which was uh they did and i i knew those folks for a while it's been handed over uh, and Ebo itself is an interesting research project. What is what is going? What went into creating it? You know, starting with the microfilm at the University of Michigan, that kind of thing, and uh, the the labor that was involved in um, making and it. The labor that's uh, involved with the TCP. Yeah, that, essentially outsourcing. That was outsourced. Yeah, international corporation, and this is right. done by some poor soul in India somewhere. That's right. That's right. A they, order a day for yeah we can do our abstruse research yeah yeah that that kind of thing but yeah. um we don't think about that we, <laughs> we, we don't we're not gonna that. think we're not gonna go there we're, we're yeah that's just one of those things i, I don't think that anyone involved actually knew at the time what was act really going on you know the the public face of the company that agreed to do it would looked good and happy and you know oh yeah and, and then uh, I forget the details of this, but a guy writes an article about Ebo, and I noticed in a footnote that it's oh, wait a minute. Yeah. 
talks about how, yes, you know, our researchers, our researches really are done on the back of exploited labor. Yeah. Um I can stop using it, but it's something we should keep. I don't know. I, I, you know, uh, it's there. Yeah. Uh, I, there's so many analogies just flying into my mind. There's so many, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's things you'd have to stop using if you, well, starting with your iPhone. Yeah. Here's my little yeah. iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, how many bridges in this world can you not cross if I, uh, you exactly. know, you know how they were built. I, you know, did all kinds of things. But uh, let's move to terrorism. Oh, <laughs> and, uh, sure. Now the AI is going to pick up that keyword. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna end up in some kind of watch list here just with the keyword because oh, it, uh, AI. Has I, a, I, I am sure there was some. I flagged. <laughs> some, yes. I was flagged by Homeland Security by some mm. of the Google searches I was doing. <laughs> yeah, I, there's no doubt, and. Uh, AI now is not Big Brother, not yet. It's more like a little nephew or niece. Right. It's, it's uh, still kind of in, in its childhood. And so it doesn't quite, it's not able to distinguish necessarily between Peter Herman's views on terrorism and the bad guys out there, whoever they might be. I hope, you know, yeah. then again, you know, maybe they were checking me out and maybe they read my book. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Well, if they did, then nothing to worry about. Gunpowder plot. There it is. I mean, nothing yes. more. No, no, nothing more. What audacity! You know, just every time I look into that, I'm going, "What? There is something creative. This is. We're going to do this. You know, we're blowing up the houses of parliament, uh, and they almost did it. Capitating the nation. Yeah, they almost did it. They how, almost did it. No, it's how, how that would have changed the world. You know. Who knows? I try not to think in those. Yeah. <laughs> um, after 9-11, the immediate aftermath of 9-11, and I'm hearing and reading how it was unspeakable, it's unprecedented, no one has ever thought of anything like this before, that one of the reasons why um, the security agencies didn't connect the dots was because they never thought anything like this could happen. And I'm reading this and I'm thinking, I've heard this before. Yeah. I have heard this rhetoric before. So I did a little searching and sure enough, I found all of this rhetoric of the rhetoric of unspeakability about the gunpowder plot. And then that's when I formulated um, my little thesis about the, my definition of yeah. terrorism. And the title here is Unspeakable Literature and Terrorism from the Gunpowder Plot to 9-11. Thank you. Yes. Where ter terrorism is a paradox. On the one hand, terrorism is violence that speaks. It's not mindless. It's not just something that happens. Um, you know, as you know, to quote that great line from Batman, <laughs> you know, it's not done by people who just want to see the world burn. It's done for a message, you know, national liberation. Uh, the protest, imperialism, something, or religious persecution, something. But for terrorism to earn the title, terrorism, to get the attention that it wants, terrorism has to do something that had never been done before. And that's the gunpowder plot. I mean, mm -hmm. there are, there have been lots of massacres. You know, that's not new. There are lots of uh, monarchs who have been assassinated. That's not new. But to blow up England's ruling class in one fell swoop, the clergy, the commons, the lords, and the royal family. 
that had never been done before. And that creates this shock wave where people are saying, you know, never, never happened. Now it's, you know, it's unspeakable. Uh, James says in one of his speeches, my voice, quoting Virgil, my voice sticks in my throat. I, I don't have the words yeah. to describe this. Cook says, you know, we do not have a word to describe this crime. We do. Yeah. Terrorism. Yeah. Yeah. So then what this means is that terrorism is not something that happens every day. So then terrorism essentially goes to sleep. Mm -hmm. Um comes back again in, you know, with the French Revolution, which is actually where we get the term for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the French Revolution. The English really don't deal much with it in their fiction. Yeah. But then you get the 19th century and the invention of dynamite. The dynamite, you know, again, we forget what an extraordinary invention that was. Yeah, Mr. Nobel. Uh, right. When Guy Fox and company wanted to blow up Parliament, they had barrel after barrel after barrel of gunpowder. You know, it, they, they basically filled an entire basement with it. Well, with gun with dynamite, all you need is like four or five mm -hmm. little whatever they're called, and put it in a bag, and you can then blow up an entire building. Yeah, but. Then the Fenians, the Irish nationalists, they decide that they're going to do something else with this. They're not going to go after people because I suppose you could say any damn fool can kill a whole lot of people. Instead, they went after cultural monuments. Yeah. So actually, the, the death toll for their bombing campaign was very, very low. Yeah. Because they weren't, you know, trying to kill mass they wanted to do was attack england's culture yeah and that's where some years later um joseph conrad picks up on this in, in the secret agent yeah you need to come up with something that's going to attack you know the you know the central cultural fixation of yeah. the age which for them was science so blow up an observatory yeah that's what's going to cause this then you know obviously you get world war one then you know world war two but that doesn't quite fit into terrorism yeah. um yeah. then you get what happens after world war two which are the uh the national liberation movements Mm -hmm. And here something else happens, which is really interesting, which is you have political scientists and people who are soldier scholars looking at terrorism as a rational, as a rational tactic. That had not been done before because everyone's going, oh, it's, un, you know, it's unthinkable. The people who do this are animals. They're not human. It's craziness. It's insanity. And these guys are going, no, 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 no. These are very smart people who are doing this. And it is a tactic. And it is a rational tactic to a rational end. Mm -hmm. Hence, you get Ponte Corvo's movie, The Battle of Algiers. Mm -hmm. Last, then we get, of course, the Arab Israeli, the Palestinian Israeli, and once more, terrorism goes in a way that had never been done before, and you get the same responses to it. But I also, as, as I had finished the book, as I was finishing the book, my wife says to me, you know, there is a book by Jody P Picot you really need to read. <laughs> And it's the, you know, the book where she's dealing with white nationalism and white nationalist terrorism. Mm -hmm. And that, I read that because it's the same problem. Mm -hmm. How um, such scholars as Richard Jackson, critical terrorism studies, they all argue that 
And what we need to do is to try and see the world through the eyes of the terrorist. Mm -hmm. You know, that these are not animals, these are human beings. And why are they committing these grievous acts? And it's something which is literature people were kind of kind of used to doing you know mm -hmm. we read beowulf and then we try and see the world from either grendel or grendel's mother's perspective yeah. we try and figure out the world from iago's point of view why is he doing this we sympathize with macbeth you know we're used to seeing the world through the eyes of a monster and I always quote the great song by Pete Townsend, Behind Blue Eyes. Mm -hmm. We need to do that with terrorism. But is there a limit? And is white nationalism yeah. the limit? Yeah. That the lie. Yeah. That I see, yeah so, he is a culture will not cross. It is, yeah, it is odd in the sense that white nationalism, you have groups that are if we look at this again, sophomorically from what we would call the hegemonic group, you know, the, the group that has hegemony, but usually these people who are most involved uh, feel dispossessed in some way. Uh, so, yes. uh, so you, it, it, there's a, there's a turn there that just mathematically or geometrically um, seems uh, hard to, hard to deal with hard to put into the same bracket i guess is the way i'm trying it doesn't yeah. fit to the box uh that people from the dominant class would go and burn churches and uh do things to terrorize communities uh it, it, all for a sense of being threatened and establishing their superiority uh when there was no need to do it well, no yeah. need to do it, but they, you know, these are also people who do feel, and in no way am I am I defending this, yeah. but you know, you know, they do feel threatened. They do feel that the world is caving in on them, and that's why they are lashing out. I mean, the difference is, you know, while I have no problem extending imaginative sympathy to the Catholics in the gunpowder plot. Right. I have no problem extending imaginative sympathy to the Fenians, you know, yeah. uh, to the Irish nationalists. Yeah. I even have no problem understanding what is motivating a Palestinian terrorist. Yeah. This is my line. Yeah. I well, it might really, it might be a real line. I just don't I don't remember, and I tried to figure out. I don't think I was trying to empathize with Timothy McVeigh, but I wanted to know. It, he I never found the place where he articulated the reason for doing what he did with that yeah. other guy. He's blowing up the that's the Oklahoma bombing, and I was just you know could you art what do you, what was it you what statement were you trying to make because you did something up you know bef that was it before 911 that was yes. like the main thing uh and you know he uh, had his come up and uh but the uh uh you know at one point you just go maybe it's just meanness it's just anger and meanness uh and i think he was you know loosely connected with I people who felt that that was like to read the Turner Diaries, this fiction piece of fiction that so uh, inspired McVeigh, and I, I got about halfway through. It's just I, it's, I cannot it's, cannot deal with this. It's utter nonsense, and, uh, and that building had a, a daycare. You know, it, know. It just it, it, it's just it's unspeakable. Well, it's unspeakable. It just. It is. You know, uh, I all again, you know, I don't have a, a problem trying to understand and, and extending sympathy to Catholics or to, you know, the Irish or whoever, whoever, whoever. That is where I get off the train, yeah. which leads me to kind of speculate well, is that how 
Protestants in 1605 felt about Catholics. Uh, I cannot, you know, was that their line in the sand? Yeah, that's so complex. You know, when we really place ourselves in it, uh, they had to change. How many times did you have to change in really kind of two generations? Uh, certainly three. But, you know, at one point, you can't be a Catholic and you can't be a uh, Roman uh, affiliated. And that's just boom. And, under, under yeah. the age. and then and then and the, every when so the sun comes in, it gets even stronger. Oh, I know. You know, and even suddenly, under the age. oh, you know, those guys were all wrong. Uh, Queen Mary, I, I really was a Catholic yes. the whole time. I mean, I, I, but I had to say this or else they would have, you know, hanged me. And uh, and then five years later, oh well, well, you know, right. I just had another. One day you are yeah. burned for not saying the mass, and the next day you are burned for saying the mass. Yeah. So when we get to the 1590s, these are your parents or your grandparents. These these this is the living memory of uh, of of church practices that were followed. So, you know, who knows how people felt when people, uh, uh, there's, oh. there's a couple of scholars, uh, you know, Shakespeare's a Catholic, you go, what would that be exactly? You know, now I know there was oh. some hard line in, in people on both sides, but so there many were, between. John Dunn has a poem about this. In the Renegado, there is a moment where one of the lower class characters, you know, says, you know, well, I'll be whatever religion you know, you, when you guys finally decide which is which is the right religion. Yeah. And he basically goes through, well, in Geneva, it's one thing. In Paris, it's another. In London, it's another. It's like, come on, guys, you know, figure this out. And, you know, you, I can't imagine that people were unaware of how di many different versions of Christianity there were. I mean, Dunn has a sonnet about this. You know, it's, is it this one? Is it that one? Is it the other one? And that this led to, shall we say, a certain skepticism mm -hmm. about the various truth claims. I mean, when I was writing another book, uh, my short history of early modern England, I was looking at all of the different statements of faith that Henry VIII issued over you know the last 10 years or so of, of his reign and i just had this vision of uh somebody walking into the local bookstore going okay so how many <laughs> do we have today you know how many sacraments are there you know which what's this week's religion and i think that that kind of led to a sort of built-in skepticism yeah. yeah. I mean, how do you claim that you have the truth when there's one truth in London, another in Geneva, another in Paris, then there's Islam, then you've got the Jews, and nobody <laughs> agrees with each other. Yeah. Everyone has a different version of this. And, and so, they're willing to kill you. And they are willing to kill you. Which is why the guy in the Renegado says, I am the religion of wherever I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is also in and of itself fascinating because they are in an Islamic country in the Renegado. Yeah. And while this was never made explicit, um, you would imagine that people did say, when you were in an Islamic country, you might want to keep your religion to yourself. Yeah. People take it very seriously. And if you open up your mouth, you are going to die. Yep. Painfully. So, you know, shut up. <laughs> yeah. And you might not even be the right kind of Islamic person, you know. Doesn't matter. Uh, just, you know, just, don't, yeah. Well, that used to be the old pub rule, you know, no, no religion in politics. Uh, well, especially with this, because religion and politics are going to get in the way of money. Mm. And that, we need to remember, was the primary goal here. Yeah. They wanted cash. They yeah. wanted trade. 
And well, there were narratives, and it fits into your. Uh, I'm, I hope I didn't miss this when I was going through, but it fits into your narrative there, there were, into your uh, thesis uh, of a good sultans, a good uh, the, uh, Solomon, and uh, you know the. Uh, uh, he's hardly good. <laughs> yeah, D doing a good thing. I, I guess it would be a better way to put it. Uh, but there's an admiration, I guess, is another way. Um, it, there's not th th their view of the Islamic world, starting, I guess, in, uh, in what would be now uh, Turkey, um, was not did not mirror the the view current view, let's say, from west to uh, near east. Uh, well, yeah, I'm not going to. They, they were quite impressed, I think, with the, the powers. Oh, yeah. Or, I mean, they or, would have to be, yeah. especially because the Islamic Empire, the Ottoman Empire, was not it's a pushover, and they had reached as far as Austria, I think. Yeah, yeah. And they certainly they had coming in. Yeah, and so, I know more, more was very concerned about that. With good reason. With good yeah. reason, good yeah. Reason. Well, that's why he wanted to remain consolidated. He said, if Christian doesn't stay together, we're toast. These yes. guys are coming in and, and take us over. he was not wrong. Yeah, he's not and, wrong, no. You know, the Islamic yeah. Empire, the Ottoman Empire, had every intention of expanding as far as it could possibly go. Yeah. These were not peaceable people. They yeah. wanted as much empire as they could possibly get. I, I just remember looking the first time at the map, you know, you go through various times of the Ottoman Empire, and I'm going, this thing is huge. Yes. I thought it was sort of smallish, and then it sort of dissipates into, it's enormous, it goes all the way down into Africa, and these guys consolidated power, they yes. had power, uh, and some, I guess one reason they didn't take over Europe is that they were busy taking over Africa and all, all of this other territory, which might have been more valuable to them at that time. Um, well, Elizabeth is, didn't happen, but it's really fascinating that Elizabeth actually wanted to have a, um, a, a military alliance with the Ottomans against Spain. So the enemy of my enemy is, is my, my friend. friend. Yeah. It didn't quite work yeah. but elizabeth also very much wanted to open up trade relations with the ottomans and we now yeah. have, i mean there is actually diplomatic correspondence going back and forth between them and they are very willing to say oh we're going to grant free reign to those of your religion yeah. In the interests of trade, yeah. that's not something you're expecting. To and see. there's, you know, there's no problem with the idea of taking taking back Granada, particularly in the south, you know, where they had already been, who still were, you know, and may have viewed uh, internationally as taken land by the great, you know, conquest when the when the Castilians went down and pushed everybody out but yeah that i i, I can see that you know uh, they i mean certainly salimus i mean that play registers more fear and respect these are people you have to take very very serious yeah, yeah this is not a common i mean wonderful and scary as as uh tamburlaine might have been he is long since dead but salimus you're talking about your grandfather yeah yeah so be scared be very scared yeah it's just amazing how uh we, uh, we run i'm i've we've gone a, a while peter i've taken too much of your time and so i'm going to kind of wrap things up here but if you would stay for a moment after we finish sure. uh, one big point i wanted to make is it, uh, Shakespeare leads to all this. You do something that reminds me of the good old days in, in in some ways, because I don't think there ever were the good old days. But I did like the flexibility of scholars that we studied with to move through Shakespeare beyond uh, before tying it all together. If not in a, you know, the old Harvard great book series, I understand the criticisms there. But 
but the 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 way that Shakespeare prompts so much other thought and how so much other thought brings us back into Shakespeare and this weaving together of of things. And, and when I was talking with Stephen Greenblatt, he goes like, I can't help but just see the world through the lens of Shakespeare. You know, when I see a, a Russian, uh, all well, a Russian, a powerful Russian man on a table, that is just, you know, it's just, you can just see it through Shakespeare. But I think it goes the other way too. Uh, and that's why I was interested in the uh, lens, turning the lens. And and that's what I think people in scholarship now are doing a lot of in, in good work in um, gender and racial studies, you know, uh, and and I have my greatest support as long as they're not trying to erase me. <laughs> because they, or cancel you. Or cancel me. Uh, but. You know that, and point taken, there has been a, an erasure of blackness in historical Shakespeare criticism, oh, and I, some fine scholars have brought this back up into, uh, and are, are, there's some wonderful work going on uh, now, uh, and I just want it all to keep keep happening. Let's let's keep the. Well, uh, I hope so. I mean, as we said at the beginning, I think there is a pendulum. I think that when people talk in terms of systemic racism inadvertently they are leaving out the contrary dissenting voices yeah. and i'm not going to say that dissenting voices are the only voices you know i'm you know i'm very aware that there was racism and sexism and islamophobia etc cetera, etc cetera. But there was always dissent. There were always cracks in the edifice, fissures in the edifice. You know, there's always some resistance. And I think that the pendulum at the moment has gone towards erasing those fissures, erasing the dissonance. Mm. I want to restore the dissonance. Yeah. Um yeah, again, this is because I was in a, a little bit of a conflict with an editor not that long ago. We were writing about Shakespeare in Japan, and the, the editor just automatically took the um, uh, post-colonial view on Japan. And I had to bring in some scholars, some excellent Shakespeare scholars to remind the editor that Japan was not colonized. Japan actually colonized other countries. Uh, so, you know, there, when Shakespeare comes to Japan, is uh, it's Japanized as uh, as as it enters, and this it's enjoyed, it's beloved here by the people who are in that. Uh, but you know, you could talk about cultural colonization elsewhere, and it has happened, uh, and go Edward Said or post Edward Said as much as you want, but that doesn't work here. There's a different model at work here. Uh, and people just have to think this whole thing through, you know, before they get busy uh, 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 knocking down uh, a, a lot of good work. Uh, and what is every generation going to reinvent the wheel? You know, we can look back at these things and we can see this consciousness. We can add to it. Uh, we can benefit from it. And, you know, is a, I don't know, a, a child born to two white parents in uh, Enid, Oklahoma uh, today, is that child going to have to carry the burden of um, uh, what a bunch of people did in 1849. I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't know where, where the cut, where the cutoff point is, you know, I think, I, I, I think uh, we got over the conquest or you know, over the Norman conquest, you know, at some point you're over the Norman conquest. Now it's still fresh and new and you still have you know, the whole thing, the whole list, the litany of these horrible uh, racial crimes, you know, particularly George Floyd and all of this that stood out, you know, to, to remind us it's not over. We're, we're nowhere close to a post-racial society. And um, uh, yet I just hope, I just hope we can keep everything in play. And I, I think it would be a better world because of it. And I think you have contributed to this better Well, world. thank you very much. You know, I much appreciate that. In, in provoking our thoughts. And, th and again, Peter, thank you so, so much for joining us for this little series. My pleasure. Thank you so much again for asking me.